Hey YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew with the Counselors Guild. Today we're doing another book review. This one is on uh, a thousand and one solution focused questions. The book, um, and it's by Frederick Benick. So let's get into it. Let's take a look at it here. Let's start with the author. Her name is Frederick Benick. I, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist. She has a private practice in Amsterdam. She, uh, her, her uh, orientation, theoretical orientation, would be solution-focused, brief therapy, CBT, positive psychology, and I think she does mediation, uh, too, if I remember right. So that's a little bit about the author. Now let's get into the book. 251 pages. Uh, it's definitely not a weekend read. Um, it's 251 pages, but there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, very, very dense. Uh, I don't, I think it'd probably take a couple weeks to get through. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're looking for a book. Uh, this one's probably not going to be a weekend read. 13 chapters, 8 appendices, and of course there's 1,001 questions. So let's start, let's kind of look at solution-focused therapy. If you're looking for a book to help you understand solution focus. This is a really good book. Um, it'll teach you where, what it, what it, it uh, you know, where it came from, who developed it, what it's all about, and the whole book is about solution-focused therapy. So if you're looking for something to understand, this would be a good book for you. Uh, so solution-focused, and I'm just putting a little like a tidbit of what's in the book. This is all by Banik. Um, so this is what you'll see in the book, and there's much more. I mean, it's 251 pages, and a lot of it's, I'd say most of it is written to help you understand the theory, um, the use of questions and how to apply that to um, your your practice. Okay. All right. So it's developed in 1980s by DeSager, Berg, and colleagues at the Brief Family Therapy Center in Milwaukee. DeSager developed a number of principles. I just listed a couple of them here just to kind of help you understand what solution-focused therapy is all about. So the first principle, problems are distinct from solutions. Okay, To reach a solution, it's not necessary to analyze problems, but it is necessary to analyze solutions. Okay, So in therapy, you're not looking at the problem. You know, Let's say your problem is um, social anxiety. Okay, So a solution-focused therapist isn't going to look at you know where that problem came from or how it developed okay it's looking at solutions okay you have a hard time speaking uh, in front of groups um, okay let's not worry about where that all came from you know some kind of traumatic event or uh, something that happened a while ago let's talk about what can we do in the in the future you know what can you do next time you're in front of a large group and you have to talk you know, what's something that you can try? Have you ever been good at it? Okay, what did you do differently? You know, it's it's looking at it's looking at the solution and analyzing solutions, not the problem. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, for example, I'm still on the first point. For example, what have you already attempted in order to solve a problem, and which of these things have helped? Okay, so it's solution. They don't care about the problem. Okay. They, they, they'll ask about the problem just to kind of get an idea of where to go, but they're not looking at the past, anything like that. They're looking at, you know, what are we going to do now? You have this problem. What's the solution? You know. Um, next up, the client is the expert, determines the goal and path to reach it. Okay. The client is the expert of their own problem, and they know how to fix it. We have to just facilitate that thinking, coming up with ideas, ways to find a solution to the problem. Um, as a therapist, you're just kind of there to support, facilitate, ask the right questions, get the client thinking in that, in that kind of uh, direction, okay? Um, if it works, don't fix it. You have you know, social anxiety, um, you found something that works, it helps you deal with the anxiety, and now you can speak in front of groups, okay, you're all set. Okay. If it works, don't fix it. Uh, if something works better, do it more. Do more of it, even if it's something unexpected. 
Look for differences that make a difference. Okay. The solution-focused professional keeps an eye out for the exceptions. We'll talk more about exceptions later. However, the interventions are aimed at helping the client shift attention to precisely those times when things were different through which solutions may reveal themselves. In this way, the client is encouraged to do more of what works better. Right? Social anxiety, speaking, public speaking, it's a big one, right? It's, it's, people are more scared of public speaking than death, right? That's something that um, I think psychology course in college then taught me a long time ago. Um, okay, you're able to make it through a speech. You know, what did you do different that time? You know, was there something you said to yourself? Did you just kind of rehearse in front of a mirror? What did you do differently? Um, so they're always looking for uh, those exceptions. Um, let's see, next up, if something does not work, do something else. Okay. Well, I, I, I avoided, um, you know, going out with a social um, uh, anxiety, so, you know, fear of public speaking or something like that. Um, well, I, I avoided the situation entirely. You know, I got a bad grade on my presentation. Um, that didn't work, right? Can't do that anymore. Um, so we gotta find something else to do. And then there's more principles offered in the book, uh, but this is just a tidbit. Uh, the author very does very good at helping you understand solution-focused therapy. Okay. So what makes solution-focused unique? What's different about it from CBT, DBT, ACT, all those other ones? Uh, the solution focused model pro proposes that problems are viewed as challenges to overcome. The solution focused interviewing looks to the past not to explore or analyze earlier problems or failures, but to rather bring the light, the, uh, bring the light, the clients to previous successes. It's the only reason to bring up the past. I think in the book she'll, she'll she coaches you uh, on all these different things that might happen in therapy. That's what's great. One of the great things about this book, she covers all the different angles. Um, and she said that when they do bring up the past, you know, sometimes the clients want to just talk and talk about the past. I think the solution focus here. She says, you know, kind of let them talk, but don't really go go to you know don't ask questions and get deep into it. You know, just let them go. Um, they maybe try to bring them back to uh, the present and the future, you know, as far as looking for solutions. Uh, so the, 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 the solution-focused professional is not very interested in the past. Not really, they don't really care where the problem comes from. They just know it exists. This person's hurt by it, and they need to find a way to deal with it. Um, next, next one. The client defines the goal of the treatment, which is pretty common in a lot of different, um, you know, theories. Most theories would say this is, you know, the client defines the goal of the treatment. You know, we all know that the client, if the client, if the goal is not the client's, they're less likely to work towards it. So I think most most people would would agree to that. It's important to obtain from the client a detailed description of what life will look like when he or she has reached his or her goal. The solution-focused professional is not a technical expert who has all the answers. He or she lets himself be informed by the client who constructs his own goals and solution. The sager, I hope I'm saying that right, assume that clients are capable of finding out what they want and need as well as how they can achieve it. It is the professional's task to help the client discover these abilities and guide him or her in creating a satisfying and productive life. So the professional is not saying, "Oh well, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got you got to manage this, you got to manage that, you know, you got to do better at this." And solution focus, no, the, the client, the client does all that. Okay. All right, so that's kind of what makes it unique, a little bit stand out. Um, next up, questions. So questions. This one had a thousand and one questions. Why are they so important? Solution focused. Um, let's take a look here. So questions that are asked are meant to map out the client's goals and solutions, which are usually assumed already to be present in, the, in his or her life. Okay? So the questions are like tools that therapists use to 
draw out this information. The therapist isn't setting the goals. The therapist isn't saying, hey, this is the solution. You got to do this. The, the therapist is asking specific, certain open-ended questions to get that to come from the, the, the client. Okay? It's almost like a trick. You know, they, they, say, they ask a certain question a certain way, and the, the, it just, the goals and the solutions tend to come out. Uh, questions are invitations to the client to reflect on what the future could look like and what steps he or she can take to reach his or her goal. The questions that make the difference. Inquire into how clients are managing despite their problems. What they think is already going well in life and would like to maintain. What has already improved since they made their first appointment. So these are just a few examples of, of what's in the book. Okay, This is all from the book. This is all Bannock. I uh, just kind of put it on here to help give you an example of what you're going to be looking at if you do buy this book and read it. Okay. Um, what has already improved since they made their first appointment? So that that's that question there, the the third one, uh, the third point. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, like one of the first questions you asked during the first session. What's already improved? You know, um, with your with your situation. And, you know, how did you do that? Did you do something different that day? You know, again, you're looking for exceptions. You're looking for kind of where to f where to start at with them. You know. Uh, maybe, it, hey, you know, you got up and, and you made your bed. Oh, that helped you feel better that day. Why don't we try that every day and see what happens? Of course, that's the therapist, you know, offering the solution. You want the client to, to do that. But, um, so let's see. Uh, questions about goal formations, questions about exceptions, questions regarding the client's proximity to his or her goals, scaling questions, and competence questions. Draw out the relevant information. And all those questions, all those questions, different types of questions are found in this book there's literally a thousand one questions um and the, and she also kind of um categorizes them like there's some solution focused questions for general use for goal formation you know um and it just says you know um scaling questions you know uh it has questions for everything okay um so all these questions are in the book, and she gives you a lot of different examples uh, of how to use them and what they're for. Exceptions. Okay, let's talk about exceptions. This is a, it's one of the, I think, important parts of Solution Focus. It's a lot of different important parts of Solution Focus. It's just one of them. But exceptions are important. Uh, asking about exceptions about the time when the client has not had a problem or when it has been less of a problem. Could be considered complimentary as well after all at those moments the client did something that worked and by paying heed to this the professional can direct the client's attention to his or her solutions rather than limitations inquiring about exceptions offer indications of what positive steps one could take again or could take more often you know going back to the social anxiety uh public speaking Okay, you had a good public speech last semester. Okay, what did you do differently? Did you go and practice before class? Did you give yourself a pep talk at the beginning? Did you go get drunk? What What did you do differently? That's what you want to find out. Um, because nobody is a complete failure. You know, I mean, I guess some people, you could completely fail at public speaking every time. But usually you find little things that improve just a little bit. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those exceptions. We're going to draw them out. We're going to make the, the client continue doing them until, you know, another exception can be found. And they just build off build off that until they do great at public speaking. Okay. Because public speaking is a skill. And you just do it to get better at it. Um, I know my public speaking class in undergrad, I got a C. And the the, the professor was like, you're an average speaker, so I, I guess I can't <laughs> move past that. Uh, and maybe she's right. I, I don't know. Uh, I think it definitely gets easier. I've done so many groups over the course of my career. I feel like public speaking is pretty easy for me. Uh, even though I do see, I do use the word um a lot, but that's because I'm trying to think. You know, I got I got I got I got to come up with the next sentence, and that buys me time. So. 
Anyway, next up. Solution-focused professionals pay attention to those very exceptions. They are always looking for the difference that make a difference. If the exceptions are spontaneous, the client can discover more about them. You know, I did a public speech. Uh, when I went to do my speech, all the, man, it was like a snow day, and there was like three people in there, and I felt very confident. So there's an exception. All right, so you do better when there's less people in the room. So when there's a full class, more people, more faces, uh, more, uh, more pressure, right? So... I mean, that's something you can learn about yourself. Uh, and, and I don't know if you could force a class to leave. You probably couldn't do that. So it's probably not something uh, you could do. I mean, it wouldn't be very realistic. Uh, but, I mean, it's something you, you, you're aware of. It is the job of the professional to notice these hidden successes and to invite the client to view them as valuable. Okay, So exceptions are important uh, to, to find... For the client to find so that they can build off of them. Okay. Oops. Oh, is that the right? Okay. Another thing you'll learn uh, in the book is that <clears throat> uh, the, the cooperative relationship. Okay. There's, there's three types, and they kind of put people in a category depending on how they look at the therapy. Do they see themselves as having a problem? Are they on the fence? Or, yeah, do they admit that, yeah, I got a problem, I need help. Yeah. Visitor, complainant, and customer. So in a visitor relationship, this is from the book. Uh, this is just a, a little tidbit. You'll learn more about the visitor, the complainant, and customer uh, in the book. And there's certain questions you ask for a certain person. Uh, okay. Uh, the visitor relationship, the client has been referred to other, by others and does not identify a problem to work on. This is no appeal for help. There's no motivation for the client to change his or her behavior. You probably have clients like that. What matters is finding out what the client would look like to achieve through his or her relationship with the professional. You know, what do you want to achieve together? What do you want to work on? you got to be here. The court mandated it. we got to spend 45 minutes together. What do you want to do? And again, you, that's just building a relationship. That's just there because you're not going to force them into doing anything they don't want to do. Just make make their time there, um, you know, as fun and meaningful as possible for them. Maybe they'll eventually, you know, start being like, yeah, maybe I do have a problem, you know. In a complaint relationship, the client does not provide information about the problem. He or she is often experiencing a great deal, deal of suffering, and there is an appeal for help. But the client does not see himself as part of the problem or the solution. The solution-focused professional acknowledges the client's pain, how do you manage to keep going, and may suggest that the client observe the times when the problem is absent or is less of a problem. Reflect on what is different then and on what he or she is probably doing differently then. Or observe the times when the problem ceases to be a problem for a short period of time. The professional can also ask clients to pay attention to moments when they catch a glimpse of what they are striving for, which is the goal. To what is different then, and to what they are probably doing differently then, and to what they are probably doing differently then. Okay, uh, so those are, again, that's kind of like the route you want to take, depending on where they're at. Uh, are they a visitor, complainant, or customer? Okay, and she and she'll give you a, a how to. She'll give you a bunch of examples of questions to to use depending on where they're at. Um, Okay, uh, so if you're new to that, which I was, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know about visitor, complaint, and customer. I knew people like this exist. Uh, that's kind of like the uh, the stages of change with the uh, um, the, the the wheel that had uh, oh gosh, what's it called? <laughs> I should know. Um, contemplative, pre-contemplative. Um, it's kind of like that, where you, you know your your interventions are going to depend on where they're at. And the stages have changed. It's kind of similar. Okay, next up is the customer relationship. The client does see himself as part of the problem or solution. There's suffering and appeal for help. The client is motivated to change his or her own behavior. The main challenge for the professional lies in increasing motivation for behavior change in clients in visitor and complainant relationships to customer relationship. You want them to be in that customer relationship. So they can start saying, yeah, I need, I need help, I need changes. And they can start 
applying things and they'll start being like, yeah, I really need to change this behavior. It's causing a, a lot of problems in my life, you know. Okay. So, and 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 the author will tell you all about that and how to get that person to that that point, okay? It's not just a book that gives definition definitions and lets you be like, "All right, well, here you go." No, she she'll she will she will take you on that journey to that to uh, of, of asking certain questions and getting them to that different point, um, and you know turning that that um, visitor into a customer. Yeah. What I liked about the book, so that was kind of like uh, just a kind of rundown of of all the different things that I mean. This is a small example of what's really talked about, but this guy had a rundown of what you'll see in the book. So just, it, it does a really good job of, of defining solution-focused therapy, giving you a lot of examples. Uh, the, the, the whole theoretical um, orientation, so they, they do, she does a really good job at helping somebody like myself who didn't really know much about solution-focused um, and helping you understand you know, what it is, how it helps, what, what the idea is behind it. What I liked about it, um, it assumes the reader is new to solution-focused therapy in your treatment, uh, which I was, and I feel like I, I understand that quite well now. Uh, I take a lot of notes when I read too, so I can always go back to those. Uh, it gives you an idea of what therapy looks like from beginning to end. So on chapter three, um, let me see if I can find it real quick. Chapter three, actually let me just give it a index, a 49, and I'll show you. The first session. I don't know if you can see that, but it says the first session. Um, so she she'll she'll go through what the first session looks like, and then there's no second section because they may not come back. Maybe that's all they got everything they needed on the first. So the next part is subsequent sessions. You know what do you do all after the first session? Every subsequent session after that. What type of questions? Um, she puts what she recommends uh, or what she uses. Um, let me see. Mm, let me see here. Hang on a second. So yeah, you're gonna be looking for whether you know the complainant. Where are they at? You want you want to kind of figure out where you know what the relationship is. And she gives you a lot of different. Uh, did I put this down there? Yeah, she gives you a lot of different ideas. Uh, a lot of good examples. So um, it, you're definitely, if you have this book and you're practicing solution focus, and you have this as like a resource, uh, you'll definitely won't get lost with this book. It's it's a very good road road map uh, in therapy. Uh, offers vignettes and shows the reader how concepts are applied. I like that. I need that. <laughs> I need to know you know a, a good example just to kind of make sure that my understanding matches the, the, the authors, you know. Uh, covers multiple situations such as resistant relapse, offering hope. So like I said before, she covers a lot of different um, things that might pop up in therapy, like resistance, you know. How do you deal with that? You know, what type of questions help you move beyond resistance, okay? And she offers that for you. Again, it offers a 1,001 examples of questions a therapist can use in therapy. Okay. Um, provides protocols to use during session in the appendices. So I like appendices um, as a therapist. It's always nice when they put um, the different types of things to use. For example, uh, um, Solution Focus likes using a session rating scale, appendency E. I don't know if you see that. It says appendance session rating scale. And you usually give this to, at the beginning, uh, or at the, I think at the end. Yeah, at the end. Um, for example, on a scale of like 0 to 10, um, how do you feel about the relationship with the therapist? You know, did I feel heard, understood, and respected? Okay. Or did I not feel 
heard, understood, and respected. And you put like, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, where would it be? Um, so that's pretty unique, I think, to solution focused. Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard that from anyone else. Uh, I know we, you know, the therapists always check in and say, hey, how's it going for you? Is this thing working? You know, is what we're doing working? Um, solution focus actually gives you, you know, a little like, um, I mean, something you could probably create yourself, um, you know, in, in like a Word document, something you could type up just to, you know, use. Cause I think this is a good, a good way of knowing, you know, if you're on the right uh, path with them. Sometimes some people have a hard time speaking up to themselves for themselves, or saying that yeah, this isn't working for me. Uh, they just kind of go along. But anyway. I do like appendices, and I like when they put stuff like that back there because it helps me um, um, understand and and even use my own practice if I like it. I do like the the, the session rail scale. I think that's a special SRS session rating scale. I do like that, um, but I did. I've used it before. I think when I was a uh, Actually, I know for sure I used it when I was doing uh, student counseling when I was interning at a university. Uh, we had something like that, and we'd give it to them at the end. Uh, and I, I most most of them would just put like ten. They wouldn't put the truth. And I use it with kids um, in a, in a position I used to work at, and they would always put ten. They wouldn't even like. So you get a lot of that, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that one time, you know, one day they're gonna really be honest and they're gonna put like a four or, you know, they're gonna put how they really feel. So uh, I do like the session rating scale. I think that's probably something that should be implemented in every everyone's practice. Okay. Uh, provides protocol. Okay. All right. So that's what I liked about it. Automation. Okay. This is what I don't like about solution focus. I feel like it could be automated okay so just imagine walking up to a phone booth kind of thing you go in and there's like a little droid there you know and talking pretending to do therapy right and let's just say you know there's a screen pops up and step one choose whether you're a visitor complaint and customer you know and they give you a little definition of each you just kind of pick one you know with whatever one you what you think you are because then that will set up the algorithm of what type of questions to ask you already know the you already know the solution, right? We just have to ask a certain but about a, que a certain amount of questions or a certain type of question for you to get there. I feel like it can be very automated. Um, so so for example, okay, it's questions. All right, figures out where you're at, plugs in the alg algorithm, and spits out the questions. All right, the first question: What brings you here today? Oh man, I'm feeling oh, I'm feeling very depressed. Okay. How is this how is this a problem for you? Oh, I just have no energy and I don't work as good as I used to and I don't feel like going anywhere and my house is a mess. When is this problem absent or less of a problem? Um, I should I should, let me use my robot voice. When is this no, I can't do it. When is this problem absent or less? Well, gosh. You know, I know last Tuesday I felt very good. I felt really good. Um, my friend invited me to dinner. Uh, my friend brought me over some some dinner, and we we hung out. It was nice. Okay. What would you like to achieve at the very least? Well, I'd like to get rid of this problem. I'd like to feel better. What have you considered doing but not tried yet? Well, I can try inviting my friend over more. Um, maybe that'll help out, uh, or maybe call call them and, and maybe just have a, a, a chat okay um, and then you know you can always say all right well let's try we'll, we'll, we'll do that this week you know every day call a friend see how that goes you know? and then a, a, every Bannock will explain this in the book at, at the end of every session the therapist always ask is it necessary or would it be useful for you to come back Okay. Uh, you know what? Yeah, I'll give it a week. I'm gonna try this, and, and I'll come back. You know, it's very automated. It's almost like the therapist doesn't really. And they say, I mean, they say the therapist, you're not the expert. You know, it's almost like you don't even need to uh, do anything besides ask questions. I mean, it's it's. I don't know. I feel like it could be automated. 
and uh, I, don't, I don't think it, it, I don't know, it doesn't really pay respects to the therapeutic relationship um, and what that what that is. So I don't know. I just I just feel that's what what I don't like about it. Um, but overall, I do like it. I mean, I mean this 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 is I mean this isn't uh, enough for me to like say oh never do solution focus. We need to get rid of that. No, it's it's a very good. It's very uh, uh, brief brief type therapy. So if you're into brief therapy, this might be a way to go. Conclusion. Uh, my my overall conclusion. If you are looking to learn more about solution focus, get this book. If you know a little bit about it and want some more help, or maybe you just want another resource in your office to help you, maybe you're stuck with a client and you just need some, maybe some, some of them questions, some of them tools to get past where you're at, you're stuck where you're stuck at. I'd get this book. It's a very easy read. Uh, I wouldn't. I don't think I would recommend undergrad reading it. I think it would be. Uh, I don't think it would make sense to you. Um, not 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 the you know, making funny or anything like that. I just think you need, you need that therapy experience to understand why these questions are relevant and why they're so important, you know. Uh, so I think it'd be more for grad or if you're in the field doing individual therapy. Um, there's also some group therapy questions in here. Not a whole lot. You'll spend a lot of time on it, but there are group therapy questions. Um, so I, I think, I think you would, you'd get a lot of, uh, value out of this book um, so yeah I would I would recommend it if you're into that you know solution focused therapy if you're if you're in any type of therapy and maybe you have a hard time with open-ended questions like I do I love quote uh, I, I catch myself all the time about asking these closed-ended questions I'm just like why did I do that I shouldn't have done that these are a thousand one plus open-ended questions and, and it's, it's more there's probably I mean it, there's probably 1,300 questions really in here because she gets she, there's questions throughout the book. Okay, and then you got the thousand and one, so a lot of good examples. Uh, and and questions are so important in therapy because it helps under un, understand the individual. But you got to ask the right ones the right way, or especially if you get a kid or a teenager, they're 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 gonna say no to everything, or I don't know. Um, these won't allow that to happen. I mean, these will you got to say something else. Um, so, I like it. I like it. I use it a lot. I like the exception. I've, I've been using that a long time, but I've noticed that it's part of solution focus. I ask the exception questions all the time because, um, especially when they, 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 like, say they're managing anger, <clears throat> and I'd ask them, you know, any instance of anger? Uh, in, you know, what happened this week? And they say, no. I'm like, great. What did you do differently? Did you try these coping skills out? Did you... You know, do your homework. What what changed this week? Okay, that's something I want to build on with them. You know, if it worked for you, then we need to keep doing it. So, um, but I like it. I get it. I would I would go out and get it if if you like. If you like, I like if you if you like CBT, DBT, ACT, I'd get it. If you're into really, if you like psychoanalytical, like Freud. You're not gonna like this book. They don't focus on anything on the past. They don't care what your mama did to you, um, anything like that. They don't analyze dreams or anything like that. It's very present oriented and future focused. What are you gonna do this week differently? What can you do? You know the answer. You just gotta find it. So, all right. Well, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to comment. <clears throat> Please like and subscribe. Um, yeah, send me a comment if you have anything. If you have something to offer, did I mess something up? Did I miss something? You know, let me know. What are your ideas or views of solution-focused therapy? I'd like to know. Do you use this therapy? I know my uh, my um, when I was working at the university, my uh, uh, professor slash well, he's also at the admissions slash counseling department uh, supervisor. He was all about solution focused, man. He was really down with it, and that's what kind of got me uh, interested in it. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Well, have a good night, uh, and uh, yeah, let, uh, let me know. Give me a, give me a comment. Uh, let me know how I did. Thank you.
Have a good night.